Hi, thank you for joining me. We're going to talk today about acute kidney injury. This is the first of two videos. So in this video, we're going to recap some of the common features and causes of AKI and think about a diagnostic approach to the acutely presenting patient. We'll have one case study in this talk and then a couple of more complex ones in the second talk. So let's meet Bob. Bob's 77 years old, normally rather spry and likes wearing a tuxedo. However, this morning he was found on the floor by his daughter. She reckons he's been there all night, so poor old Bob's quite confused and can't give you any history. Unfortunately, his daughter has not spoken to him for a couple of days, so doesn't know if there's been any deterioration. When you look on the system, you can see that Bob has a past medical history of hypertension, non-insulin dependent diabetes, ischemic heart disease and arthritis. He's had two MIs in the past, when he was 55 and again at 61. So he takes um, amlodipine, ramipril, furosemide, bisoprolol, metformin and ibuprofen PRN for his pain. It's now three o'clock in the afternoon. He's been seen in A&E. They've given him some meropenem and he's had a hip x-ray that's shown no fracture. So you get to Bob. He's not really giving much up in terms of history, but his chest is clear. Heart sounds are normal. His abdomen's soft, but when you press over his bladder suprapubically, it gets a little bit distressed. And PR shows mildly enlarged prostate. GCS is 14, and that's owing to some confusion. And indeed, his AMTS is 7 out of 10, but no focal neurology. Looking at his fluid balance, his JVP cannot be seen. His lips and tongue are dry no peripheral edema on the feet. His obs look okay, slightly tachycardic, and he's got a borderline grumbling temperature. Looking at everything else, he's got some bruising over his ribs and his hip, and they're a little bit tender to the touch. And that's not that surprising given he's fallen and spent the night on the floor. So Bob's blood tests. His full blood count looks okay, nothing too interesting there. U's and E's, well, this was an AKI talk, so they're going to be abnormal. Urea is high, creatinine 289, a little bit hyponatremic. Rest of it looks okay to me. So what do you want to know regarding the, these renal tests? What's the key question here? And that's what were they before? Is this normal for Bob or is this not? We want to know how much Bob weighs and we really need to know what his urine output is. And we want to ask, is Bob an at-risk patient for acute kidney injury? So in terms of staging your AKI, this depends on your creatinine, and in particular what it is compared to the baseline, or what his urine output is. And both of these, or just one, can be used to classify. So with Bob's numbers, we'll have a look in a minute. So Last three blood tests for Bob have shown a creatinine around 132 with an EGFR of 48. Bob weighs 88 kilos. In the acute setting, we should focus on the creatinine, not the EGFR. But for the sake of um, any urgent scans and things, a cockcroft gault measurement is always useful. His urine output in the last 12 hours is uncertain. He remembers going last night at around 9 p.m., but whether this is reliable is unclear. And what's happened since, very difficult to, um, to assess, but we can just check his underwear and see what, uh, if there's any staining or anything like that. So we now have the information to classify him and he's going to be a stage three. And that's because there's been an urea for 12 hours. And we're basing that on the fact that when we checked Bob's underwear, there was nothing to be found. So at risk patients. So there's a, a whole list here. I'm not going to go through them, uh, but you can pause the slide and have a look. But we can notice immediately that Bob fits a few of these. His diabetes, his meds, his age and his medical history. So the classic approach to diagnostics is one that I still use. So we can split into pre-renal. Dehydration and hypotension are the most common. But drugs, overdiuresis, so again, iatrogenic renal artery stenosis and renal vein thrombosis, a little bit more rare, but need to be considered. Intrinsic causes, probably the toughest to learn if it's exam time for you, but acute tubular necrosis, the various glomerulonephritides, 
nephritis, vasculitis, and so on. And someone of Bob's age, we should always think about myeloma in this situation as well. And post-renal is thinking about blockages. So as you've got a large prostate and there's stones or, um, or cancers in the bladder, something pressing on the ureter, as so you've blocked a catheter off, and more unusually is retroperitoneal fibrosis and neurogenic bladders. But these, again, these need, do need to be considered if the others are not quite so clear. So back to Bob. Confused, found on the floor, and we think this is a long lie. He's not passed urine in over 12 hours. He's dehydrated based on our examination and those bloods. And he's on several suspicious medications. Must think about over-the-counter ones as well. Always worth asking. So just pause the talk for a minute and think about what your differential is and what tests you'd like to do. And we'll go through them in the next slide. So let's look at some of the initial tests available to us. So we've got our basic biochemistry and we've compared it to what's gone before. And that's the most important thing here. So we're going to send off clotting and cultures, a CRP, and we can check his diabetes status as well. An HbA1c might be useful. Capillary blood glucose, so we have an instant answer. Make sure that there's nothing diabetic leading to, um, to his renal failure. And given the long lie, we should probably send off a creatine kinase, especially if we're thinking about rhabdomyolysis. The most commonly seen in long lies, athletes, heat stroke, that sort of thing. We can do a urine dip fairly quickly and send off for a culture. And then decide whether we need any radiology. Should we scan Bob? He's got no urine output. We've done a PR. What we really should do quickly is a bladder scan. And this will give you an answer as to whether he's producing urine and it's not able to make its way out or whether he is dry. The bladder scan can't tell you about blockages further up though, so that's based on your history. Anything more specialised, more fancy stuff, anchors, azotiters, myeloma screens, maybe not just yet, um, since we have a story that makes sense. So let's have a look at his results. The urine dip was positive for leukocytes and nitrites, and there's also a bit of protein and blood on there. Bladder scan shows an empty bladder. Clotting is okay, CRP is moderately raised. HbA1c comes back as 68, so not, not wonderful control. And his creatine kinase comes back as 800. So there's a degree of muscle damage here. Whether we can truly call this rhabdomyolysis is, um, is debatable. It takes 24 to 72 hours for rhabdomyolysis to really occur after the muscle injury. So it's more of a watch this space and he will need daily readings. I can tell you that Bob's urine cultures grew E. coli and his blood cultures showed no growth. So what we have here is a multifactorial picture and that's a very common occurrence, which is why I've put it here. So often we can make a logical sequence of events for these patients. So Bob's story is that he contracted a urinary tract infection, which led to him becoming dehydrated. And it's possible that dehydration led to his UTI as well. Either way, both have made him feel dizzy and he's had a fall. The fall has led to him having a long lie because he can't get up. His confusion and his arthritis have made sure of that. And there's a potential for rhabdomyolysis. All of this is exacerbated by his medications. So whilst his meds aren't necessarily the cause, they are factors that have made things worse. So he has both pre-renal and intrinsic factors. I would say with Bob, mostly this is pre-renal. It's likely after this level of insult, he could develop acute tubular necrosis. So again, these patients need close monitoring for their urine output and daily use and ease. If we want to think about this more neatly, then we can create a problem list for Bob. He has dehydration, UTI, a long lie with uh, potential rhabdomyolysis. He's got drug induced and query ATN on its way. So for acute management, we're going to give Bob some fluids. Fairly straightforward. Deciding the correct amount, however, not so easy. How are you going to decide? There is no uniformly correct answer. There is no certain amount. What you need to do is match it to input, output, and how much you think the patient will tolerate. So we know Bob's had two heart attacks and he takes furosemide normally. So we're not going to load him with fluids too quickly but we do need to keep a very, very close eye on his output. We can encourage oral intake, then think about a catheter, 
and urine bottles, depending on whether he'll comply, to me measure his output and give him fluids to match that. We're going to keep him on broad spec antibiotics because he's had a positive dip. And we're going to hold his ramipril and his furosemide temporarily. So you need to think about the pros and cons of holding these. Is he going to start swelling up once we've rehydrated him? Is his blood pressure going to shoot up? All things to think about. I'm going to stop his ibuprofen. This is going to be a much more uh, permanent fixture. And then his rhabdomyolysis. So we need to have our guard pretty high for this. So we're going to do daily CK measurements and think about if, uh, a urate measurement and monitor his use and ease. If the CK is rising rapidly over the next few days, he will need discussion with the renal team. So time to discharge Bob. So after four days, luckily his CK had been dropping rather than rising. It had gone down to 500. Creatinine had gone down to 160 from 289. So a good improvement there and his confusion seems to have gone away. So he probably needs a few more days in hospital just to let that, those numbers um, get a bit better and to get him back on his feet, get physio on board and so on. So on discharge, Ramapril and Frusenide are restarted and this is an important point. Because they're not the main cause of this, then we can restart them at the same dose or depending um, on sort of your senior decision maker, may reduce the doses slightly, but they don't necessarily need to be stopped. That's the main point. However, NSAIDs in elderly patients that have other nephrotoxics and high risk factors for AKI shouldn't really take NSAIDs. So we're gonna stop those. That's it for this talk. So that's our, our first case. We'll pick it up in part two. In the meantime, have a look at the Trust Acute Kidney Injury Guideline and you can access that on Insight or via the Doctor Toolbox app. There's nice guidance on AKI. And if you are sitting exams, then if your exam is anything like mine were, then glomerulonephritides and autoimmune conditions are gonna be pretty prominent on your papers. So um, definitely do some further reading. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please do subscribe. Thanks for listening.